Good morning. It's very good to see each of you in our presence today, and we hope you're having a good day, and it's great to be here on the first day of the week. The day our Savior resurrected from the grave, and the day that means everything to us. It comes at the first of the week to remind us that He is first in our lives. He is number one. He is above all other things. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit, because Paul one time made a statement. We're going to not only look at this statement, but some things that Jesus taught us about. But as you look at this, Paul taught us of the value and the good of understanding that it is worthwhile to lose everything if it means gaining Jesus Christ. And this is a, a lesson about what is Jesus worth to you, what's your soul worth to you, and what's heaven worth to you. Paul said, yet indeed I count I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as, as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Clearly, in the, the mind of the Apostle Paul, the greatest thing that you could have is Jesus Christ. The greatest relationship you could have is with the Lord. The greatest knowledge you could know was knowing Him and that it would be worth the counting of all things as lost in your life in order to have him and to possess him and to know you're in a right relationship with him. Now, really and truly, Jesus taught us a lot about this as he went through. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46, in his teaching, he gave like in the parables, two parables that showed the worth of him and his kingdom. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field which a man found and hid and for joy over it he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field kind of keep in mind that statement he sells everything he has in order to possess that great treasure and again the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it both parables emphasize the fact it was the worth selling everything you had, the giving up of all your other possessions to possess this. Now Jesus is saying to you and me, that's what my kingdom ought to be to you. That's what it's like. It's worth anything that you'll ever have to give up. It's worth any price that you'll ever have to pay. Also, as we go through, we want to keep in mind then, what is Christ and heaven worth to you? That's kind of the theme of this lesson, both in Paul's teaching and in the teaching of Jesus Christ. What's it worth to you? Now in Matthew 6, Jesus taught, verses 19 through 21, that we should not lay up treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy. I don't take that to mean that it is wrong to have a savings account or wrong to possess anything, but that by comparison we understand that our treasure cannot afford to be here on this earth. Don't lay up treasures here where moth and rust will destroy where thieves could break in and steal from you, but lay up your, for yourselves treasures in heaven because whatever we invest in heaven, he says moth and rust will never consume that. It'll never be destroyed there. No thief can ever steal it. And there's an added advantage that where our heart is, where our treasure is, that's where our heart is going to be. So when we put our treasures in heaven, when we think of it from that perspective, then he's also saying that that helps us to get our affections in life in the right places. We read again in Jesus' teaching, and he says, If anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, that lays a lot of emphasis. The idea that it is worth denying you to have Jesus. It's worth putting aside anything that offends God to have Jesus. It's worth anything you have to give up to have Jesus. And he said, you need to be able to take up your cross, and you need to follow me. And then he reminds them that if you give up your life for my sake, you won't have lost anything. But if you strive to keep your own way, your own selfish pleasures, your own sinful ways, if you strive to do that and lose Jesus, you lost him and your soul. Matter of fact, Jesus follows this teaching by saying, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but he lost his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Think about, imagine as the 
the rich man did in the story of rich man and Lazarus. Imagine lifting up your eyes in torment. Imagine he had things in this life, he had the pleasures of this life, but he lifted up his eyes in torment. What would it profit him if he had had all his wealth and all the other wealth in the world, everything you can imagine, and yet his soul ended up being lost? How terrible it will be to lift up our eyes in hell. And sometimes we don't read this part. After he says, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? He said, the son of man is going to come. The Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father, and He will reward every man according to His work. Please keep in mind that when the Scripture says He will reward, that's not always positive. It's the idea of He will pay back to every man for what He has coming. If it is good, if a man has done good and served the Lord, He will pay him back for that. If he has done evil, he will pay him back. It'll all be according to the works that we've done. Don't let the word reward make you think it's all positive. It can go either direction according to what a man has done and what his works have been. In Matthew 19, verses 20 through 22, a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Everything you've been talking about, all those great commandments, I've kept from my youth. What do I lack now? It's a good attitude to have. But Jesus said, Well, if you want to be perfect, Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It says when the young man heard it, he was very sorrowful because he had much. He had a lot of earthly possessions. Jesus said something unique to this man from the standpoint, you take everything you got and give it away and you come follow me. That really wasn't anything too unique to physically following Jesus at that time. You know, you may think, well, that's kind of a big thing to ask that man. But did you know that Peter and Andrew and James and John, that when Jesus called them, they didn't even have to be told go sell anything. You remember what happened when Jesus called them? They laid their nets down, didn't they? They were all fishermen. They left the fishing enterprise and went and served the Lord. I, all I'm saying about it is Jesus didn't even tell them Give up everything. Give up all this fishing stuff and come follow me. Because as soon as he says, come follow me, they put it down. So Jesus is talking to this very well-to-do young man and says, well, if you'd give all that up, you'd come follow me. But because he had such possessions, he wasn't sure. He went away sorrowfully because he wasn't sure if he could give that up. That's a solemn question. Well, Taking us back to what Paul taught us about. You know, Paul is laying emphasis to the idea in uh, Philippians chapter 3 about the idea of, and this isn't bragging, it's, uh, it's just trying to acquaint us with the history of his life. He said, you know, at one time, I was somebody in the eyes of a lot of people. At one time, I was up and coming in my nation. People looked at me and they thought highly of me because of who I was and what I was, not, not just because of moral things, but because of the prominence that he played. He says, I am one of the circumcision. That's just another way of saying one of the Jews. And I worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ. And I have now no confidence in the flesh. But he said, if anybody could have had confidence in the flesh, He's not talking about your skin, and he's not talking about sinful fleshliness. He's just talking about, as a human being, if anybody could have had confidence in who he was and what he was, Paul says, I think I could have had that because I had more than most people have in that department. Again, not bragging, but just reminding them. So I was circumcised the eighth day, meaning that I was covenant person of Israel. I wasn't a proselyte. I didn't come into this late in life. I, I started my life as one of the chosen ones of God, as the Old Testament talked about. I'm of the stock of Israel. I, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, anytime in their language they kind of doubled up on something, it was to give it stronger emphasis. Just like king of kings. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. You want to talk about the law? He says, I was a Pharisee. Everybody knows that that was the strictest of sects. 
If you want to talk about zeal, Paul says, well, I was strong enough that I went out and persecuted the church. Now, I know as a Christian thinks of zeal, that's not so good, but as a Jew, he said, I was dead serious about all of this. If you want to talk about righteousness and thinking that you had to be real strict about the laws of God in the Old Covenant, if you want to talk about gaining your righteousness by trying your best to follow those laws, most people would have looked at me. And I don't think Paul is so much saying it was true, but most people would have looked at me and said, man, that's a blameless fellow. I don't see anything about that guy that he's doing wrong. He really works at keeping the law. But Paul said, even though I was this person and I had all of this honor and people respected me for these things, I was willing to lose all of that to gain Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, verse 7, and kind of Paul keeps repeating that theme. Those things that were gained to me, I'm willing to count it all as loss for Jesus Christ. Do I mind that I'm not prominent among the Jews anymore? Do I mind that I'm not looked upon and greeted and told, Rabbi, Rabbi, am, am I... Uh, do I feel bad and sad that I, I don't have those things? No, Paul says, I count them as lost for Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of what people give up today to become Christians isn't necessarily comparable to that because most of the time when we talk about what we give up, we're talking about giving up a sin or a way of life that's sinful instead of righteous in regard to those kind of things. Sometimes people are called upon because they become children of God and they learn better about certain things. They are called upon to leave a certain religious organization that they've had ties with and, and they understand, I, I just can't be a part of that anymore. I, I can't worship with those people anymore because I'm striving to follow exactly what God says for me to do. Sometimes those are a little bit more comparable to what Paul was giving up there. But Paul says, if you think, I think it was awful to have to give all that up. You're wrong. I was glad to give it up. I don't have a problem giving it up, he says. He says, I count everything. I count all things lost. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. To Paul, who had had this incredible career as a young man, he says, do you, do you think I ever weep over what I lost? He says, I don't. Because I've got something that replaced all of that. And he says, what's replaced it is, I know Jesus Christ. He's not talking about, I just know about him. I, I know him. Like the Bible often uses the term knowing somebody to talk about intimacy. I know him. I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is now my Lord. And I, I've suffered the loss of all things. But he says, if you think that's a problem for me, understand, I count it like it's rubbish. If it means that I gain Jesus Christ. F.F. F. Bruce, the commentator, made an interesting comment about that. He said, Paul emphasized the fact that the only knowledge that anybody, that's worth having for anybody, is a knowledge that's so transcendent, so exceptional in value, that it compensates for the loss of all things. Get back to those two parables that we read side by side there, the parable of the pearl of great price and the parable of the hidden treasure. The whole point about those parables is the guy found something that was of surpassing value. And in each case, it didn't matter if he sacrificed every other possession he owned, if he grabbed and possessed that field. And within that field, there was a treasure or there was a pearl over here. He says it's worth anything because that thing that nobody much knew about, that thing is so far more valuable that it doesn't matter if I lost everything else. I don't that worth it so far beyond all this other thing. So it is, this is exactly as Paul pointed, Paul's point of view here. And, and 
this is no triviality. He did. He lost his place among the Jewish leaders. He was important. He was somebody. He lost his good standing among his countrymen. They persecuted him now instead of respecting him. It doesn't really lay a lot of emphasis to this, but don't you know that he lost many, many friends over this? People he'd been close to, people who had been important in his life. <clears throat> I've always found it interesting that Paul doesn't make any more mention of his immediate family, like his father and mother, and I don't know, perhaps they died by that time or whatever, but I just have found it interesting. Maybe he was an outcast in his home now. Maybe they weren't interested in ever having his back, having him back. You remember his father was a Pharisee he talked about. Maybe he didn't so much respect Saul anymore. We know one thing, he abandoned what could have been a pretty safe existence, a comfortable existence, and one instead that he took on became one in which he would, in fact, lose his life. When Paul says, you know, I count all that as rubbish, he, he's saying more, the word loss, you know, conveys the idea, well, you know, I just something I, I lost, I gave up, or whatever. But when he says, I'll look at it from now on like rubbish, that's a word that can mean everything from animal dung to what's in your garbage can. And Paul says, to me, all of that now is of no more value than what's in the bottom of my trash can. That former manner of life, and brethren and friends, I'd really like for us to get that kind of spirit about the former thing. I, I don't know, you know, people sometimes who come out of another way of life and come into Christ ha have a more, you know, big break than some of the rest of us have. I, I grew up in a godly home, so I was kind of taught all these things, and I, I'm not going to tell you I didn't need the Lord, because I sure did. And I'm not going to tell you I didn't sin, because I certainly did. But here's what I understood. I realized all of this was true, I guess, from my earliest times. I realized all of these are things were so, and I had to live like this and believe like this and act like this. And I, I just don't ever really remember a whole lot thinking any other particular way. I knew sometimes I didn't keep it so perfectly, but I still believed that these things were true. But... But Paul's situation, like some of y'all's, was different because he came from another place in his life, another way. It wasn't an immoral way, but it was a totally different way of thinking. It would be comparable to my mind in this day and time to the conversion of a Muslim to Jesus Christ and to know that his family will forsake him. He will be opposed from this day forward. But Paul says to me, I wouldn't take that way of life back any more than I'd bring the stuff out of the bottom of the garbage can back in and put it on our table to eat. It's rubbish now. I don't want that. And I hope in our hearts, whatever it is that we gave up, whether it's sin or false ways or whatever, I hope in our hearts what we're saying is, boy, to me, that's no life to go back to. That's no thing to, to return back like the dog that returned to its own vomit or the sow that washed wallowing in the mire. Paul says to me, that's how I think of all of that now. Well, Paul had an understanding, and this has some bearing upon our invitation. It's not the invitation, so don't have to grab your song book just yet. But Think for a moment about this because Paul says, I came to understand I needed a righteousness more than what was in the law. <clears throat> I told you earlier about growing up and understanding certain things to be true. There's a lot of folks sitting here that grew up that way too. But let me ask you a question, because I kind of already admitted this about myself, but if you grew up understanding right and wrong and, and doctrinally what was true and, and all these other things, did you keep it perfect? You know the answer as well as I do. You didn't, and I didn't. So why didn't we keep it perfectly if we do it? Because we know our human frailties, and we sin, and we do wrong. <clears throat> and at times we choose to do otherwise from what the Word of God teaches. 
Paul admitted that struggle with it himself in Romans chapter 7. He said, I sometimes think of good things I need to do and I don't do them. And sometimes the things that I, in my mind, I say, man, ought not to do this, and then I end up finding myself doing them. You read that struggle in Romans 7, and you'll see yourself in that. But he says, where does my victory come from and all of that? And he says, it comes from Christ. Thanks be to God who gives me the victory in Christ. And what Paul is acknowledging is that in spite of the fact that I, I will agree, man doesn't have to sin, there's nothing compelling man to sin, but man chooses to sin, man chooses to do wrong sometimes, man offends God, and that makes righteousness in and of ourselves an impossibility. Because how is God going to be pleased with righteousness that's marred and blemished with sin? This is like wearing a beautiful white coat up here but having a big splotch on it. It may be white in 98% of it, but if you've got a big stain on it up here, everybody notices the stain. Everybody sees that. A bride comes down the aisle in her dress. She may be radiant, but it, it, you know, if she has a big spill on her down here, it, everybody's going to see that, know that. How is it that we could hope to have, even if we had a perfect record nearly, but we had a splotch of sin, and nobody even thinks we're close to a perfect record, but we had a splotch of sin on our garments. You're going to notice that. It's going to be seen, and God's going to see it. So how do you stand before God in righteousness? And the answer is found. Paul says, I wasn't searching for a righteousness of my own. That doesn't mean that Paul didn't think that he had to be righteous after he became a Christian. It doesn't mean that he doesn't think righteousness is important. What it means is he understands that all of us, if we do not have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to wash away our sins, we are in trouble in our standing before God. You're in trouble and I'm in trouble. None of us will stand before the judgment seat on our own perfection. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you dare go before the Lord God on your merit instead of the Lord's merit, you're a fool. I hate to say it that way because I don't want to misuse the term, but I, I'm telling you the Bible thinks you're a fool. You're making a deadly, dangerous choice because you're going to look into the eyes of a holy God and he's going to judge that sin. And in this life, you could have had that sin taken away by the blood of the Lamb. You could have been washed in his blood. And so through your faith, and I think he's talking about a faithful obedience to Christ, but through that, you'd have a righteousness that comes from God. There are two senses of righteousness in the scripture. There's the sense of living righteously, and the Bible never negates that or says don't do that. But in the end, we do understand that we would be in a bad, bad position if we didn't have the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. His blood is what we need to cleanse us from all of our sin. And there does not exist a man other than the Lord Jesus there does not exist anyone who doesn't need this. We all do, and we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Paul goes on to explain what he wants to gain. Now, it's kind of on different levels, and it's kind of the same thing we talk about. We want to gain the Lord, but we also we want to gain heaven. We want to gain the uh, resurrection of the dead. And Paul says that he counts all things as lost, to know him and to know the power of his resurrection and to know the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus Christ. He's saying, I don't mind. I don't mind understanding in this life a fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ that even leads to some great sacrifices and perhaps at times I suffer because of Jesus Christ. He said, none of that bothers me to give up what I had and go to this because at least, at least, as you think about Paul especially, when he underwent some type of persecution, he's sitting there thinking, I feel a fellowship with Jesus Christ. I feel a connection with him. The fellowship of his suffering. And he says, being conformed to his death, 
if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. You know, I, it's very clear in this story that, that Paul is saying, I, I wanted to know Christ, and I want to understand him, and I want to I want to have a fellowship with him, even if it means the fellowship of his sufferings. And I want heaven. I want when the trumpet sounds, I want to know that I'll be resurrected unto life, not damnation. I want the resurrection of the dead. I want to know that when I'm put in that ground out there and my body lies there and my spirit rests with God, I just want to know that I have that hope of the resurrection of the dead. I want to know that's not the end for me. So Paul says, I press on. And I find interesting some of the things Paul says about this. He said, I don't think I've already attained it. He said, I don't count myself that way. I don't think I'm already perfected. <clears throat> but I do press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I, I think this is a real key right here for all of us to understand because I think a lot of times Christians feel like <clears throat> that, you know, well, you know, maybe I have doubts about myself sometime or, or maybe I feel like that I, I, I haven't mat matured enough in the sight of God. I don't know if I'm there yet. Well, Paul says, I don't even count myself as there yet. You know, there's kind of a difference between thinking in terms of being saved, but saying, I got it, it's in the bag, I've, you know, nothing to worry about here. He said, no, I don't even look at it that way. I just keep pushing ahead. And I'll tell you, that, that's how all of us will have our hope. And that is, don't get stagnant, don't stand still, keep pushing ahead. He, he kind of repeats this thought because Paul says, he adds to it this additional thought, but he, he says, in essence, I, I don't do this thinking, what did I leave back there? But I keep pushing on and pressing on. I, I don't count myself to, to have apprehended. That, that means I haven't grabbed it. It's not in my arms yet. But this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. Sometimes that's talked about, you know, well, just, just forget about those old past sins you've committed. I don't even think that's what he's saying here. I think he's saying, I don't want any of those things to allure me. I forget what's behind, and I reach forward to those things that are up ahead. Uh, I find this a beautiful ending to our story. Basically, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I, I love that because think what he's saying there. It is as if God is out there beckoning to you and me. Keep thinking of things above. Keep living for those things. Keep your mind on heaven. I'm calling you upward. You know, I love that because in life I feel like the Lord lifts us up and gives us something better and causes us to, to rise above what we would have been in this life. But it's a bigger picture than that. Paul says, I'm pressing on. I'm going ahead for the, I, I want to be called up. Surely he's talking in part there about that resurrection of the dead again. I, I'm calling you up to be with me, God says. That's the prize I'm offering you. Paul says, that's the one I want. The upward call of God. We have to keep what's important in front of us all the time. Let me tell you something, brethren, and here's something we need to think about. I'm going to end on this point. We need to be careful about something because don't you think there's a lot of things in our lives today that seem very urgent, like this really got, this, we got to get this done. This is important. We've got to make sure the kids get to do this or that. A lot of things that occupy our attention, a lot of things we as adults even think, well, I really need to do this. And, and I don't deny that. And there's some things you, of course, can't afford to uh, immediately always put off. But sometimes all the things that seem so urgent in this life, we better not forget about that which is eternal in nature. Because the urgent things, the pressing things, the things that, that keep saying, hey, you, you better do this, you better do that, you, you better make sure this is done, all of those urgent things sometimes distract us from the one thing that will count when you breathe your last breath, 
when you're taken from this earth, when it's all over, and you won't care about any of these urgent things at that moment. All that you'll care about then is the eternal thing, what, what it wound up you being. And I think we have to get Paul's spirit there. Press on and forget about these other things and remember in your heart of hearts what's eternal. So how about you? Have you answered the upward call? In, in a world where sin is bringing people and, and spiraling down, bringing them further and further down in a, you know, in a cesspool of sin, it seems like to me God is saying, please come up my direction. Come out of all of that. Get away from that. Come ye out from among them. Be separate and come towards me. Draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. I look at every invitation like, in a spiritual sense, God's got a hand out to you and saying, look, come my way. Here's my hand, come my way. And we already know God's done his part because God, God created us and God made us to think a certain way, a spiritual nature, and he sent his son to die and Jesus paid the price on the cross and the Holy Spirit has revealed the word of God and so we have all of that, and, and now there has to be a response just as surely as God has his hand out to you and says, please come, let me come, bring you my direction, an upward call. As surely as God has his hand out to you, you're going to have to take that hand. You'll have to reach back and grab his hand. He's not going to lift you out of it unless you make an effort. And the effort you make won't be one of self-righteousness. It'll be one of responding to what he's offering because the response is faith in who is raising that hand to me. Faith in Jesus Christ who says, come, come my way, believing that he is the answer. And repentance, because I know, like Paul says, I can't have my mind back on all of this if I'm going to go forward. And confessing who we want to go to and be with as the Son of God, truly believing in our heart, and establishing it on our lips and then being baptized and when we are baptized our sins are washed away and we have no longer the righteousness which is our own but the righteousness of being baptized into Christ and putting on Christ I believe you will need to continue to live righteously but you know what if you continue to live righteously in sin you will need the blood of Christ again if you have strayed, John talked about that, brother. I'm writing to you that you sin. Don't sin. But if any man sins, he's got an advocate with the Father. And understanding that even when we're walking in the light, sometimes we're guilty. But the guilt makes us stop and think, I need to confess my sins before the Lord, and I need to repent of them. So if you need to obey the gospel this morning and come and be baptized into the Lord Jesus, or if you need to come and confess sin and be restored by the blood of the Lamb once again. We call upon you to do that. But keep in mind what you're doing. You're answering not the preacher's call or the church's call, but God's upward call, like Paul had to answer it. He's got his hand out. What do you plan to do about it? Let's stand and sing.